John. Good morning. I can't believe the year's going so fast. October 25, 2020, in the year of our Lord, and we're gathered once again at the Girl Heights Presbyterian Church to celebrate life and to give God the praise and the glory, to thank Him for our blessings. For truly, we have so much for which to give thanks. So we gather here today in, the, in this Zoom or Facebook communication. And I know for a fact that there are those who are calling in or tuning in from Virginia and from New York and Delaware and Texas and all throughout Charlotte area and South Africa. We know because I hear from you. So it's good to know that you're with us. Welcome once again to our service this morning. Two more weeks we'll be going to the polls. And I know you're going to go. And I've been joining with the thousands of other voices over the course of the past uh, several months. And I must confess to you, I am so sick and tired of all these ads these commercials on television and on other media outlets. I'll be so glad when the process ends. But I also want to remind you that the church has a candidate in the race. His name is Jesus Christ. And his platform is simple. It said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men and women and children unto me. As we go to the polls to vote for an earthly candidate to represent us in office. I hope that every day we are also promoting our personal candidate, Jesus Christ, who wants to rule over our lives, to enrich us to live life abundantly. Thank you for supporting the Mira Heights Presbyterian Church ministry financially. We are so grateful for your, your faithfulness and your commitment to us. You're sending in your tithes and your offerings, and sometimes we get uh, contributions from people we don't know. Thank you for those gifts. They're making a difference in our ministry. Tune in every Tuesday morning for Bible study and devotion, and I mean for prayer and devotion at 9 o'clock. The numbers here is on your screen, and you can join us at 12 o'clock and at 7 o'clock as well for Bible study. We've been serving those who are in need. We have a, a book ministry. We're making books available to children in our community who don't have access to the kind of books they need to read. So we have a, a bookmobile that's out there that's distributing books to those children. Thank you for making that possible to us. Let's have a word of prayer, please, this morning. Gracious God, we are once again blessed to be here at this time of worship and celebration. I pray now for the word to come to me and that the Holy Spirit will equip me and my tongue, my mind, and my heart to preach this word to those who need it so that our faith can be strengthened by what we learn today. Give me utterance in my stuttering tongue, but I will not stutter. Fix me, O Lord, that I can preach with conviction. And maybe someone who doesn't know you in the pardoning of their sins will come to find out who you are and come to give their lives and their devotion to you. Be with us now, we pray at this moment, as you bring the word. Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do, please turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm going to give two readings. They're a little bit lengthy, but it's important I read you the, the scripture this way. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Follow along with me, if you will, please. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live 
the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry, they think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who was ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near, mm, my God. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Mm. Each one should use whatever gift he or she has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. And if anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. The Word of God for the people of God. Permit me today to give you some significant background for this brief message this morning. I talked last week about making the Word of God real. I held up the Bible because I wanted you to make sure that you understand uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, Terendous, one of our technicians, said to me, sir, said, Pastor Tuggle, when you held the Bible up, you, you reminded me of President Trump. I said, oh no, please, I don't want that to be the case. <laughs> so I'm holding the Bible up because this is the compass. This is the roadmap. And unlike other people who hold it up, I read my Bible, and I believe, <laughs> I believe what it says. But, but I want us to take the Bible, I want to give you some background today. When Peter wrote this, his first letter to, uh, to the Christians in those days, the Apostle Peter writes out of personal experience to assist the early Christian believers who had been scattered abroad as they faced the possibility and the agonizing problem of undeserved suffering because of their faith. Can you imagine being persecuted because of your faith? Can you imagine being hounded and, 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 and ostracized because of your faith? Well, that was the fate of the early Christians. This was a new theology, a new way of approaching the universe, a new way to live life. Here comes this Galilean named Jesus, Jesus who is giving some bizarre and awful and strange teachings. He was telling the people things that they were not accustomed to hearing. He was telling them if somebody strikes you with one cheek, turn to them the other also. He said, you got to love your enemies. You have to be kind to those who abuse you. He told people, if someone asks you to go one mile, don't go one, go two. And if someone takes your coat, give him your coat also. He brought them all these strange teachings. He said to the people, I want you to feed those who are hungry and provide housing for those who are, are homeless. I want you to give water to those who are thirsty. And they said, wait a minute, 
That's not what we're used to. And then on top of all those teachings, he added the coup de gras. The coup de, the coup de gras. He said, I want you to believe in me. He said about himself. If you believe in me that I am the Son of God, if you believe in me that I am the Son of God, if you live, you will not die, and if you die, you will live. Oh! They said, this man is a fool. This man has lost his senses. No one dies and comes back to life. And by the way, who does he think he is to think that you have to believe in him? But Jesus was clear. He says, I am the Son of God. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then he says, be obedient to my teachings. Not only will you live, you'll live, it's quoted in John chapter 10, verse 10. Memorize these verses. I said to you last week. Memorize these verses. John 10, verse 10 says that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you shall have life and have it more abundantly. So here comes Jesus saying now, Believe in me, and you shall live. Well, this is whole new teachings for people. They hadn't heard these kinds of things before. And so many early Christians, they began to suffer socially because of their now faith in Jesus Christ. Sometimes their own families disowned them. The government, especially the Roman government, was not their friend. And the, the Jewish zealots. Remember Paul? Remember Saul? That was the name before he became Paul. Saul was going around Palestine arresting and persecuting Christians because of their faith in Jesus Christ. People were walking away. They were shunning anybody who said, I am a Christian. I am a follower of the way. So Peter writes here in the fourth chapter of 1 Peter. He gives us their, an understanding that there are two kinds of sufferings, he writes here. The first kind of suffering is the suffering that one experiences from doing evil. The, and, and, he, and he wants to encourage those who are experiencing, uh, those who are going through evil things, he says, you are going to suffer. But he also says, he writes these verses to encourage those who are experiencing the agony of, listen to this, undeserved suffering. Undeserved. Say it with me. Undeserved suffering. Peter points out how that Christ suffered in the flesh that he might be our Redeemer and our Savior. So there's undeserved suffering. And then he tries to give them some assistance so they might avoid suffering due to the results of illegal and immoral activity. Some things we do that are illegal and immoral, and he says those things you will suffer from it, and then he lists some of those things here in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. And he talks about them as debauchery, living a debaucherous life, and lust and drunkenness and orgies and carousing and detestable idolatry and more and more. Those things are illegal and they are immoral. And they're going to cause you to suffer. You're going to suffer from guilt. You're going to suffer from missed opportunity. You're going to suffer because you cause other people to suffer. Your friends, your family members. And when you cause people to, that you love to suffer, that brings additional suffering to you. So, then Peter writes these words. Mark in your Bible, now we're going to give you again. 1 Peter chapter 3, he says about those of us who suffer because we're doing good. It says, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Oh, that's the question. Who is going to harm you when you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, listen please, if you suffer for what is right, the verse says, verse 14 says, you will be and you are blessed. 
Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. Always be ready to tell somebody about the hope you have. I was so fortunate in my growing up, I was raised by a single parent, and I've said this, those of you who know me know the story, uh, we had a very difficult life growing up. I, the first nine years of my life, I lived in an attic with my mother, and just the two of us, and we didn't have a kitchen, we had a bathroom, and just a toilet and a sink. We didn't have a lot. She worked with local cleaners and all that stuff, but, but, but I never wanted for anything. I never went hungry, I never felt unloved, never felt unprotected, and why? Because she had something that was worth more than a billion dollars. She had the Word of God in her mind that flowed from her lips into my ears. And that gave me an understanding about life. And the Word of God would give that to all of us and it taught me something about suffering for doing good. Don't you know when you do good, sometimes people will not like you? <laughs> they will not like you when you do the right thing. When you stand up for that which is moral. When you have strong ethics. You have strong standards for exercising your love for others. When people turn against you and say things to harm you do things to hurt you, and out of your mouth comes words of forgiveness. That's strength to be able to forgive somebody. That's power. It says you're going to suffer sometimes for doing good, but don't let that stop you. So my topic this morning is the Holy Scripture is speaking to our condition. Holy Scripture is speaking to our condition. I was about to say the Bible speaks to our condition, but I want to just speak, and, and I hope that we get these words. Holy Scripture speaks to our condition. So Peter says there are two kinds of suffering. One kind of suffering, you suffer because you do good. And when you do that, people who are not doing good, they're going to talk about you. People, according to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, the pages of the world, they're going to think, oh, you're holy and rolling, and you think you better than we are, you miss holy and miss, uh, miss righteous, and all that stuff. Who do you think you are anyway? And they're going to talk about you, but don't let that stop you. Because you're answering to a higher authority. The problem comes in when you bow down to that criticism and you lower your standards to live in the way that those who are criticizing you live. So you start acting like they live. You use the same four little words they use. You have the same bad attitude. And, and then others, if they hate you, join them in the hatred. You join the bandwagon of all the evil things and things that are immoral that they're doing. And you count it as right because they count it as right. Okay, here's one for you. When you get a chance, I'm going to give you some scriptures now. When you get a chance, go back and read Isaiah chapter 55, verse 20. Here's one. This is what's happening right now in 2020 America. It says in those verses, it says there'll come a time when they'll call evil good and good evil. They'll call sweet bitter and bitter sweet. That's what it says. Isaiah chapter 55. I want you to look at it. I want to just read it to you very clearly because this is the time in which we are now living. And it's, it is clear. And, and it says, you'll, you'll find that when you want to do good, evil is always present. Don't allow yourselves to fall into so-called fake news. The Word of God is not fake news. And those who live in the Word of God are not living in fake news. So Peter gives these guidelines for living on the edge. On the edge of what? I'm going to use a, a strange kind of word. I know you know what the word is. On the edge of eternity. 
Now, why am I using that word? Eternity starts. Okay, I gotta make it very clear. When does eternity start? Okay, here we go. That's the question. I'm asking one more time. When does eternity start? The answer is it starts the day you accept Jesus Christ as Savior. That day you march into eternity. Now, we have to balance what I mean. We're on the physical side of it now. But on the day of transitioning, that's what death is, is a transitioning day. We're not dying, we're moving on in our journey that we started the day we accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. So the scripture speaks to us in our condition. So here we are now, COVID-19 raging all around us and people are being contaminated and contracting the virus all around us and over 218,000 of us have, have passed on to glory, so to speak. But those of us in Christ, the scripture is speaking to our condition now of COVID deprivation and it's saying to us these words. Peter could have been referring to the end of the age, but the end of the age starts right now. We can't see it, but it's here. This year, 2020, I believe, without exaggeration, I've known of at least 20 to 23 or 4 people who died from COVID. Or I know people who know people who died of COVID. Two pastors I know died from COVID-19. Their congregations are devastated because of it. This week, in recent weeks, I've had several going home services here in the Greer Heights Presbyterian Church and other Presbyterians in our community here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I go to these services and, and they're, they're always sad, but also a moment of gladness. But I noticed something else. Those of us who walk in Christ, we've already stepped over into the age of eternity. And the moment of transitioning is just that, that's what it is, it's just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what is death? It happens in the twinkling of an eye. Before you can even bat an eye, you move from this side of the Jordan to the other side of the Jordan. And the scripture speaks to us and it prepares us for that instantaneous transition. No, I'm sorry. Could I say instantaneous? It's quicker than that. It's quicker than being instant. You're here one moment in the physicality of life and before you know it, before you know it, you transition over into eternity. How could, he could, Jesus, Peter could have been uh, thinking about the possibility of, of their annihilation as early Christians, annihilated by Paul and the early Jews and the Romans, maybe thinking about the, the martyrdom. He provides some guidelines for proper conduct for believers as they live on the edge of eternity. That's where I am. Until I transition over, until you and you and you and you transition over to the actual eternity beyond the physical part, here are some things that essentially we must do in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses uh, 10 through 11. And verse 7 says this. He says, verse... 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 says, The end is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and in self-control. The King James Version says this, Stay sober. Be clear-minded and self-control. Stay sober. Don't let your mind be confused with artificial stimulants. Stay sober because no man or woman knows the hour or the day and night when we shall be called. So it says, be sober, and then also says, he encourages us to maintain a constant communication with God. Constant communication. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, pray in season and out of season. But I'm not talking only about the prayer mode. I'm talking about being in communication with God all the time. 
driving down the street, preparing their meal, constantly being reminded who you are and whose you are. You don't belong to the world and the worldly values. I don't care what 45 says or doesn't say. I don't care what the Supreme Court says or doesn't say. You and I have higher standards and different standards to live by. And so we've committed ourselves to the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it says over here in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, and it says these words, Practice hospitality. And it says love must be genuine. It has to be genuine. It has to be genuine. That reminds me what it says over in Romans 12. Love must be sincere. But it says in the verse, it says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. And then it says in verse 9, practice hospitality. Oh, now that's part of the COVID-19 environment. But in the times of Peter, we wrote these verses, there were no hotels or motels. There were no Motel 6s or Ritz or Marriott hotels. That, those things didn't exist. So when a traveler is going down the road and he is somewhere to stay, he had the cultural right to knock on doors asking for help. And sometimes a, a sympathizer would come to the door and look at this stranger knocking at the door asking for help, for shelter, and maybe some food or water. A sympathizing ear would say, well, I don't know who you are, stranger, but welcome to my home. And they would treat that person to a meal and shelter for a season of time, maybe a day or two. In those days, it was lawful to allow for a three-day stay of a stranger in two years. You have to. I know that's stretching it a bit. I don't think many of us are going to let a stranger walk up to our door and, and say, uh, Sir, uh, ma'am, uh, I'm traveling to, to Florida and my car broke down. I have no money. Can I stay at your place for a while? I don't know many of us these days would let a stranger come into our home. That's how far we have removed, been removed from common decency. There was a time when a stranger had a, a moral right to ask a stranger for shelter or for food or water if they needed it. Unfortunately, the way we live these days, we don't trust strangers, we don't trust their motives. It could be the devil in disguise. Oh, there could be a serial killer, we think to ourselves. And so we shut the door and say, no, you may not stay in our house. The shame is on us. That we've allowed ourselves to fall so far removed from the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where we are now allowed substandard values to govern our lives and how we interact with others. Rather than loving others and treating a stranger as if I can love you, give them the benefit of the doubt, we now have all of the reason to be suspicious. So we, we, we hold back our intent to be helpful because we don't know who they are. Lord, forgive us that we have allowed our culture and the standards of our nation and the dangerous environment in which we live to hold back our ability to share the love of Christ. The Holy Scripture speaks to us, and you find it in 1 Peter chapter 4. I read to us part of it this morning. And then it goes on to say in verse 10, each one should use whatever gifts he or she has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, listen to this, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. So what do you do in your home, what you do in the community, it should be done in such a way that as you're doing it, people will see Christ operating in you. 
That smile will run across your face in a difficult situation. How can they smile at a time like this when our culture is crumbling? Our society is disintegrating and they walk around with a smile on their face. Because we have the confidence and this blessed assurance that Jesus is ours. And that we walk in the light of our Savior. And we stand on the anchor of His words. He is the rock on Christ the solid rock. We stand. Amen. Father, we come to this moment when we're closing in the service and we pray that the word has gone forward today with clarity. Help us to know that we're called to live in the ministry of words and the ministry of works. To not be ashamed of who we are in Christ in this difficult time. Thank you for this opportunity to walk by the guide and the road map of your instructions. The Holy Scripture is speaking to our condition. And we give you praise in Jesus' name.
Amen.